Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. I don't know if this is about foundation, so I'll do my best. And I was going to be really courageous and just redo a whole talk and not have any graphics and just do bullets on what I wanted to say. And then I fell asleep on the airplane. So um, I'll still just try to uh, talk through what I want to say and not get too caught up in the graphics I happen to have. But I like to start with this graphics on the left because I'm very proud of it. Obviously, none of us did it. And this was this uh, uh, May New York Times uh, article. And they, I think the science writer actually did a fairly good job um, largely because he wasn't writing about computer science because the Times doesn't seem to really understand what's interesting about computer science. But if they're writing about other sciences and things, they do a pretty good, uh, a pretty good job. So uh, we work on environmental monitoring applications uh, as a driver for this technology. Uh, so SANS is an NSF Science and Technology Center. We're 3.3 years into the process, uh, which means we're writing our renewal proposal, and I'm here anyway, even though my renewal proposal has to be turned in in a week. And... Um, uh, then we get, because they like to give you some cutoff time, and then it's eventually 10 years uh, overall uh, funding from NSF at about $4 million a year. Um, UCLA, uh, USC, uh, UC Riverside, uh, Caltech, and the new uh, UC Merced uh, all have involvement. And uh, everything here um, uh, should not be attributed to me, but rather to this uh, excellent uh, collection of colleagues that I have. So why do we do environmental uh, monitoring applications? Well, first of all, they sort of give us this focus goal of creating programmable uh, autonomous uh, distributed observatories in the context of applications where we can really engage the people who need the application. So it's very convenient on a university campus uh, to be able to work with scientists as, as uh, early adopters. And obviously, this is not a great innovation. This is how computing has happened and, and developed in many aspects is by engaging the sciences to really uh, uh, push things uh, forward as they are initially seeded by, by DOD activities. A lot of uh, rich university uh, uh, growth happens and then uh, industrialization of different parts of it comes along and fortunately makes things, uh, makes things robust. And I think um, I was uh, surprised to hear that for the most part I agreed with everything that uh, Chris said and you'll see that, um, you'll see that there are sort of some, uh, some similar, uh, similar themes there. And perhaps the only thing I disagreed with was his implication that uh, in the university you shouldn't be off looking a step at or, or whatever in a different direction or ahead or of, uh, of, of unsolved industrial uh, problems. I think there's a, a rich uh, mix of those things that, uh, that we can do. But there's um, many ways in which we've sort of, we're not doing the, doing the more robust link level thing and it will be fantastic as Dust and others uh, really uh, solidify that base. So uh, why this collection of applications is because they s provide spatial variation and heterogeneity. And I bother to say this because for us, we're very much focused on the embedded network sensing. So a lot of what we do isn't about the, uh, the networking. It's that the systems are networked, but it's about networked sensing. And so it's very important to us that we focus on applications that actually need uh, networked sensing. And if you, have, uh, if you don't have high spatial uh, variability, then you don't need to sense in multiple places. You can sense in one place and then, and then uh, estimate what the value would be in another place. And if you don't have heterogeneity, you can also probably uh, develop better models to still sense in fewer places and estimate what the, um, what the uh, uh, phenomenon will look like in another location. And so it's where you do have a lot of variation in heterogeneity where you need to do uh, denser uh, observations. So this is sort of I, what I did in this talk is more just sort of what we were doing before and where more of our emphasis is now. And this is a, actually a slide I put together um, when I didn't fall asleep on an airplane on the way to a Nokia workshop back in February, because I noticed on the way, I looked at the agenda and saw they had me down as to giving a historical perspective on sensor networks. And so I put one slide in there that was a historical perspective. And Chris, did I get the dates right this time? Thank you. Um, and I didn't include this talk in this uh, slide until I heard Gordon say um, that sensor networks started with the Nest program. So I had to put this slide up here, Gordon, um, for you. Uh, so um, sensor networks really started with, in, it, with uh, Bill uh, Kaiser and Greg Potty and Chris, you know, simultaneously working this area of, uh, of starting on this notion of network sensing and wireless sensors. And then it's been just an incredibly rich 
area. And then there's a lot of early precursors to this. If you talk to Danny Cohen, you'll find out that actually, and I have a collection of notes from a, a DARPA DSN workshop uh, that was taken, and it's uh, depressing to look at the commonality of issues that they, that they sort of brought up then, but it was just way too early for the technology to really, uh, uh, really take off. Um, that being said, there's just a lot to do, and um, it takes a lot longer to make progress than certainly I ever expected, and I think a number of others as well. So even though the work has been going on for a while, there's still a tremendous amount uh, to do in many aspects, and lots of uh, uh, conferences and places where this stuff is now being discussed. Okay, so uh, to the extent that this is sort of being revisited, uh, for us personally, I think we started out with early themes being about thousands of small devices, um, and uh, minimizing sort of individual node resources uh, uh, used and exploiting very large numbers and looking at systems that were really going to be fully autonomous. And if I look at the work that uh, where we uh, emphasize most nowadays, it's absolutely on heterogeneous systems. And as I said to uh, Johel Esteen at the break, um, because he claimed that that was the first time he'd ever heard somebody talk about these sort of centrally controlled networks, I said that if you'd ever listened to me before, you would have heard that we'd said this in the past. Um, this is just the usual Berkeley UCLA joking among friends, so don't uh, take it too seriously. Um, so uh, we uh, very much focus on tiered systems where the microservers, that's just a term that um, Mike Horton offered up. It's a terrible term, but no other term has come to be better. So open uh, call for a better term than a microserver. But where these microservers, these 32-bit processors that sit in the network, aren't just gateways and um, uh, play a role in the, in the network sensing. And uh, secondly, the reason that uh, heterogeneity is so important is because we seem to, while this is a lot motivated by dense sensing, we're somehow inevitably undersampling uh, phenomena. Now, when you get to more engineering and uh, industrial applications, you find out what the needed sampling is, and you, they are probably uh, not necessarily in that realm. But certainly in the science applications, you start out not knowing what is the spatial frequency, if you will, of the phenomenon. So you're uh, with, with any static uh, sensor placement, and um, you're, you have this problem of, of undersampling. And so we've uh, emphasized a lot more in recent years exploiting multiple modalities, actuation, and multi-scale uh, uh, observations. And then the other thing that's really in the last year been uh, more focused for us is not being so focused on fully autonomous systems, but rel realizing, and again, in retrospect, this is just obvious, uh, AI went through this, others have gone through this, is that uh, there's so much um, perspective that a human user uh, brings that if you design a system that, uh, com that uh, incorporates that. So this is my conclusion slide up front, and now I'll say a little bit more uh, about each of these. So uh, in heterogeneity, um, our deployed systems always uh, contain multiple uh, types of nodes, and our systems are sort of fairly heterogeneous, and this isn't a perfect, but it's sort of a reasonable uh, set of dimensions for that heterogeneity where we're trying to balance the desire for scale, meaning points of observation, uh, with lifetime, that this thing can live autonomously without being serviced or either for energy or other things, and yet uh, this have this other dimension uh, that was brought up of sampling rate. And so when we're just looking at trying to maximize scale and uh, lifetime autonomy, we'd go for things like moat, moat clusters or herds. When we have a higher sampling rate, uh, we are more in the realm of doing collaborative processing arrays, imaging, and, and acoustic things. And uh, yet when we want to be at that higher sampling rate and yet we need longer lifetime, we end up bringing in forms of uh, mobility and also human interaction, such as that example of the street networks thing where you're uh, immobilizing the, uh, if you try to fully automate the ticket giving part of the problem, you're taking on something that's full of all kinds of policy problems and things like that, and that human being is really good at, at dealing with those things. So it's a perfect design to say, get the system to help actuate that, uh, that ticket giver, not to try to fully automate uh, the whole process. Um, so we sort of live in this, in this space, and by using a collection of these types of nodes, then you can try to address all three of these dimensions uh, simultaneously and uh, trying to come up with software architectures and then, example, and then uh, instantiations of algorithms and things that really optimize across the system uh, as a whole, not just on the individual uh, nodes' roles in these, in these things. So that sort of notion of whole system optimization is that we're trying to um, uh, 
at the same time that the individual nodes are getting uh, lower power and more efficient and more capable and, uh, and link level uh, more robust, uh, in that context, then, we want to be able to optimize across the, uh, the collections of these systems. And uh, part of that is then where the uh, larger nodes that are able to have more of a purview of all, over all the data, for example, the um, controller, is that what you called it? Was yours a controller? Manager. manager. The manager in Chris's network uh, sees a lot of what's going on in the network. And if you're then going to, <coughs> uh, if you want the nodes to adapt their thresholds to ambient levels or what's going on, the manager is the obvious place to be able to see all of that and tell the nodes how to adapt their local processing. And so it, 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 um, uh, we have this uh, software architecture uh, called Tenet, and Ramesh Gaminan is sort of the lead on that. Eddie Kohler is very involved, and, and, and students. And uh, the idea there is to, just, is to put that software in, infrastructure in place that recognizes that that's what's going on in these networks. And c absolutely, the you know, configure, don't compile. And to create a rich interface between the uh, manager and the nodes to be able to make that configuration uh, really uh, very, very rich. So it's not just about who you route to. In fact, one of the students is back at home writing a, a paper looking at actually centralized routing algorithms and comparing those where the manager computes the routes uh, for the nodes versus doing it completely distributed. Um, but also when it comes to, as I was saying, the particular local sensing and filtering and processing that the nodes are doing. And so we um, do a lot more of our distributed uh, computing up here at the, at the microserver or manager level and have a set of uh, processing libraries that you can uh, invoke on the moats. And what this pr uh, project is doing is trying to do a well-defined interface here. And um, as opposed to having all moats listen to others and adjust their ambient levels and all sorts of things that I, uh, that I and others looked into in earlier years uh, in the field, which were really fun algorithms to try to design and were much more similar to things like uh, uh, a scalable, reliable multicast, if any of you are from uh, uh, that part of the world, and were fun things to design. But as it happens, it makes sense to keep these things pretty simple and optimize them. When I say whole system optimization, you want to optimize these things to be as low duty cycle as possible and have as robust uh, a code as possible. And so you, but you, at the same time, you want them to do as much local processing on the data as they can so that they, you know, move a whole time series down to uh, an event where possible or some kind of signature or some kind of profile. And you can have your cake and eat it too. You can do both of those if you don't try to do the fully flexible any to any what kind of processing I should be doing here. But rather, you have an adaptive tree, whether you call it a mesh where you're writing one direction or, or, or not, you have an adaptive tree so that it's robust, that's multi-hopping because obviously you get coverage with some small number of, of, of multi-hops. And uh, yet the kind of local processing you're doing is informed by the much greater perspective that the controller nodes have. So this is just taking Chris's story, I think, about routing and applying it to the sensing story, uh, uh, sensing story uh, as well. And so... Uh, to motivate that and to tell you about one of my other favorite little projects at the same time uh, is when you start to look at uh, nodes that are doing a little bit more intensive things than monitoring uh, microclimate or, um, or, uh, or lower data rate, things like that. And, and imagers are a perfect example. So um, many phenomena at this point, because of the limited state of, of, of sensor devices, are only observable in the optical domain. And uh, in fact, I'm very involved in the, in the uh, ecological community in, in biology and sort of, in some sense, I think of this as imagers or are, are the only kind of biological sensor that you can actually deploy. So if you're looking at a plant and you're watching it blossom, you can actually recognize that change in color histogram or shape or size. And so our idea here is that we embed these images in the environment. They're not webcams. They're not, they're not just sending back many, many frames to a human being or to a centralized uh, computer to process. And they're embedded imagers that have local filters for what they're looking for, okay? So you can program into them looking for a change in color histogram or size or shape. And um, at that point, then, you can operate them at about the same terrible power levels as a moat. I realize that's damning with faint praise, but it's a lot better than a webcam. And we should be able to, you know, follow some of the same, uh, some of the same benefits. So this is a joint project with, um, with colleagues at... Uh, at uh, Agilent because we use their, um, their CMOS imagers. And in fact, it came out of a conversation with somebody whose name I can't remember at Agilent uh, talking about the mouse, right? They're optical mice where 
the, Im the, CMO the imager there is being used as a local sensor of where you are. And so looking for opportunities to make use of this very rich modality. Um, then, so we have um, prototypes of these, and there are folks in the community who are starting, uh, starting to use them and some of the base uh, uh, software to support it. And um, we have an initial uh, network that we're putting up uh, where we're using these things to um, both do that kind of change detection that I described as well as trigger uh, uh, l broader scale, higher power uh, sensors. There are sort of uh, lots of work that can be done um, when you start to bring these devices into play. Now, what does this have to do with that software architecture I mentioned? It's exactly an example of that case where what the, the imager is fixed in a particular place. It doesn't have to solve the general computer vision problem, which is good because you're not going to do that on a microcontroller. But and if you have to configure into it, into it just one rule for doing local filters, it's not going to be able to do much. But if you go to that tenant architecture where you have the uh, manager node detecting changes in ambient levels, uh, and then you can start to uh, tell the, the local imager, have it adjust its filters so that it can be much more successful um, in providing useful event detection. Uh, so there were a couple other things I wanted to I wanted to mention that has sort of changed in our uh, objectives over the years. One of them is the very important and amplifying effect of articulation, which um, in particular, you know, which is just uh, uh, in includes uh, wider scale mobility, such as in our, our traffic uh, um, meter or ticket giver, as well as smaller scale um, art, uh, mobility, such as the NIMS project I'll mention in a second, and then even smaller scale articulation, such as in rotating a camera. And again, this just relates to the fact that while we are focused on dense sensing with any static um, uh, array in many of our applications, at least initially, we are inherently and we're always under sampling. So uh, the NIMS project uh, started by Bill Kaiser, uh, we always sort of wanted to involve um, mobility, recognizing that you want to be able to fill in gaps and bring in higher end sensors. But what the NIMS project did is made that feasible by recognizing that um, you don't have to invoke an equally hard, if not more challenging, uh, discipline of robotics to solve the sensor network problem. And so you, uh, you cheat and put up infrastructure for the, robot, for the robots to move. So they're, they're doing autonomous uh, sampling. And there's a whole array of cool algorithms that you can design in here to have these uh, robotic uh, sensor devices that can lower and elevate sensors and sampling. And in this confined environment where you can put up this infrastructure, you then get the ability to have real sensor diversity in terms of placement, because you can move around in that 3D volume. And you have sensor diversity in terms of size of sensors. You can put in higher end spectroscopy and, and imagers and things that complement the more uh, the, the static uh, uh, sensor array. And so we're really starting to be able to look at, and we do this above ground, and we've been uh, found that uh, our colleagues are very interested in this in water uh, environments uh, and public health environmental engineering applications where they're trying to characterize things like uh, nitrate runoff into, into streams that are coming off of agriculture and fertilized uh, uh, lawns and things like that and how that's affecting uh, water quality. And yet it's very difficult to actually uh, study something as dynamic as a, as, as, a, as a stream. And so we've uh, done deployments over streams that have been very successful using this, uh, using this NIMS uh, technology. And uh, we have uh, at the top, because those are real pictures, you can see that they are actually uh, real um, deployments. And then we have uh, plans for future deployments that are in uh, uh, cartoons, because they're not real, that are in much more three-dimensional and um, relate to something I'm going to get to now, which is about rapid deployment. So something else that we've discovered, aside from the general theme of heterogeneity and the importance of mobility, which is just another form of heterogeneity, is the importance of interactivity and rapid deployment, which I completely ignored in the original set of things that I set out to do, and that was a mistake. So first of all, to go to systems that are going to be very long-lived is very challenging, very difficult. And in fact, it just skips over a set of applications where you don't need to be there forever. You need to go out and rapidly deploy and do a study and then fold up and move on. Not all applications are that way, but there's a very rich set uh, within application spaces, even when you're surveying where you want to go, think of the tool you need to go and, and study an environment before you go out with one of your static uh, deployments. You want to go out and really understand all the spatial heterogeneity, sort of do a surveying, and use that to then go and lay down your static, uh, static sensor array. So doing systems that support rapid deployment, um, uh, and with things like uh, NIMS in particular, has really 
allowed us to get to some, uh, start to get to some of those science results um, that people are always asking us, so have you made any new scientific discoveries yet? And uh, the answer is almost. Um, and interactivity uh, also helps with another very difficult problem, somehow I'm moving up this slide, which is data integrity. So it's going to be a, uh, this issue of data integrity and calibration is enormous, uh, huge problem. And it's going to be a long time until we have auto calibration. And what we need in the meantime are tools by which human beings can detect uh, outliers and, and diagnose problems. And you need to do that when you're out there in the field because you actually bring with you that human observational capability as well as an added set of sensors that you can't um, uh, statically and autonomously uh, uh, deploy. So we've been spending time just on, it's not a, it, it's, a lot of it is not a big a research problem, it's more a piece of infrastructure that gives users out in the field the statistical access to statistical tools and models and GIS data and remote sensing data so that when they're out there in the field you can see the data points that the static sensor network is giving you, stick it into your models and in real time discover does this look like this is, this is anomalous, it doesn't conform to what I expected to give and why is that? Is there something faulty in the connectivity and the coupling to the physical environment or is that in fact an interesting uh, place in the world? So being able to be out there and get access to all, all kinds of uh, data and, and to have the human being be able to contextualize the in situ observations uh, is an important uh, system uh, requirement. And so, um, and this is also admittedly not necessarily a part of the talk, but I couldn't stand up and give a talk and not mention MSTAR. So, uh, all of this requires uh, doing all these things, something that has sort of stayed constant in our sort of little bit of a history of, of shifting uh, emphases has been the need for a rich development environment and the, uh, and this, and the famous Jeremy slide, uh, dimensionless slide, of uh, you know, scale versus reality and the need to be constantly traveling through this space uh, as you're doing simulations and then as you need to get more real but at smaller scale and do emulations and you want to go out to the real environment and you don't want to be switching back and forth between your, uh, between your code base. And so uh, MSTAR, um, in these contexts of more complex systems, particularly systems that you're using for prototyping and studying things, they're relatively complex. You haven't, uh, you haven't gone through uh, your phase of figuring out what's the minimal set of capabilities you need to solve this one particular commercial application in this one environment. They're very much experimental systems. And so uh, there's lots of, uh, of software that ends up needing to run in there. And, um, and so what MSTAR has provided to our development environment from the NIM systems we do to the uh, moat herding uh, and clusters we do, it, uh, does, it allows us to um, uh, simulate, emulate, and um, actually operate these uh, heterogeneous uh, systems with uh, a fair amount of reuse of the underlying uh, software components, both from the runtime software components as well as a lot of the uh, sort of management and, and, um, and logging uh, related uh, things, which are so important to, uh, to uh, prototyping, of course. And so um, I'll just end with um, saying that I'm very involved in, in what I hope is an opportunity to put a lot of this together, which is this National Ecological Observatory Network, which um, if things go well, um, our hope is, is that we will be seen as this administration's token opportunity to fund something related to the environment. And um, it's a lot cheaper than actually doing anything about it. And so we will, um, the, the plan is a, something on the order of a $400 million MREFC um, major research and equipment um, allocation uh, from Congress and it's pretty well along in the process where what it is to me of course is a continental scale multi-scale sensor network and um, in fact it's for continental scale observations of things like the impact of, of uh, climate on uh, biodiversity and, uh, and, uh, and drivers to invasive species and infectious disease uh, sort of components so we actually have an ability uh, to observe what's going on uh, below ground in the water and above ground in our environments. And it is, uh, what's exciting about it from a more practical perspective is that um, as this rolls into sort of prototyping over in the next year and then, and then beyond that is it will be a concentrated, coordinated market for sort of the experimental side of this technology. So instead of the scientists on your campus and another campus, each of us going to certain unnamed vendors and paying a lot uh, per, uh, per device, this will be a large aggregated market, both for the hardware and the, and, and the software that will hopefully um, bring, the, uh, bring the cost of this down and also really lead to a very large uh, continental scale 
uh, observatory off of which we can get data and then do our, our lab-based uh, investigations. And then just to say, um, it's convenient to work with the sciences. There's good, uh, rep there's a long uh, history for working with the sciences to push forward the technology, but obviously what's going to dominate the field are the engineering uh, applications that come. And so figuring out how to sort of couple our uh, university-based investigations more effectively with how we uh, give input into um, industrial applications is, um, is important. We're doing questions now, okay? Mm -hmm. But it seems here that uh, some of these aggregation, at least uh, the ways that we actually want the data to flow, is actually intimate coupled to some of the process in some So I just, just want to see where we draw this line okay. to optimize them. So it's an interesting question. There's no one answer. Yeah, maybe you can try and summarize the question. Yes. Uh, so there seems to be a bit of a contradiction uh, between on the one hand, that there's opportunities for doing in-network processing, and on the other hand, uh, Chris's uh, claim that you don't want to uh, try to do both uh, processing and communications, both on a, uh, that they uh, compete with one another um, on a resource-constrained platform. Um, and uh, so the question was sort of how do we think about, to what extent do we optimize our communication patterns to serve the kinds of processing we do? Uh, so I... Uh, you know, have given talks, and you guys have heard it, so I can't pretend that I never said it, that, that, that um, we should guide our uh, communication patterns in order to be able to do in network processing. Um, and I think at the level of the sort of moat that I was just completely wrong, and that um, the in-network processing does happen at things that I consider first-class citizens of these embedded networks, but those are more at these, uh, at these uh, uh, manager networks that if you saw in my tenant picture, there were sets of those, and they're doing distributed processing over things like Wi-Fi uh, and, and such. And it's just that if you, if you want to optimize these guys to be as long-lived as possible on a coin cell battery, you optimize them for that. And so what you want them to do is be able to get their data ro robustly to the controller node. You also don't want them to communicate any more than they have to. So if they can do local time series processing, that they should, okay? But that they go through this guy because their little time series process will aggregate with the next guy, I think I was just barking up completely the wrong tree. Now, that being said, I think as we start to look at virtual Earth and Google Earth and other things like that and web services for these things, which I, you know, I think is a, is a great new area there as we start to operate at that scale and doing, you know, adaptive web caching and adaptive web services for all these sensor streams, there, I think you'll start to want to move your data around to where it needs to be to aggregate best and things. And things. I think we'll, we'll maybe appropriately reinvestigate that problem, uh, that problem there. Do, Lou, did you want to correct me? I just wanted to add a comment on this. That I think another aspect of this is this uh, tension between starting a, um, develop, a development system and something that's optimized. Yeah. Yes. And a lot of cases, um, Park was saying, well, we could have an ARM processor with all this memory on a tiny thing, um, but we probably have to have a lot of very specialized aspects of that hardware to serve particular applications. And there's, this, there's that very interesting thing that as the environment becomes more and more uh, static and well-known, you can do that optimization. And, I mean, that's why people still use FPGAs, right, in another realm, and they even use them in, project, in products because it's, it's hard to know when you're really to that point of, just being able to put it on a, you know. Yeah. Another data point is that uh, the kind of ads that uh, Chris was talking about, that we send a sample to every minute or mm -hmm. so, versus your microimager. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the ones that you probably want to actually do a little bit more filtering at a node as to what images to send. Absolutely, but it's completely consistent. It's just the next, I mean, it's, it's very much consistent with what he's describing. I still don't think that you end up doing your routing according to what image might suppress another. 
um, uh, at all. Maybe it ends up influencing sort of which master you choose or, or when it comes to the masters exchanging information, you get into applications such as the one that Lou works on, where you have lots of acoustic ranging data and things like that. You have to start to be, even in, an, even in a Wi-Fi environment, smarter about what you pass around uh, when and to whom. What did? Well, I just wanted to start with more conversation than a question, but it seemed like the, the question started in one place and ended up in another interesting place. So oh, I'm sorry. To go back to yes. the first place, I, mean, I, I think this is a, this is a very timing sensitive thing in the networking layer. Preserve their own processes. Yes. And, so on. and you, know, you might want a compressor to do things that you would defer you know, till, till later. It's, it's not sort of in the sense, I don't think you were saying you wouldn't do processing in networks. No, I didn't read that either. Uh, you would be asynchronous and how mm -hmm. you do that. Yes. Right. But I think Chang was actually asking more about adap how adapting your routing to that. Right. There is some sense that, sorry, I don't know. <laughs> Go ahead. In some sense, the choice of, of doing like a two tier architecture is somewhat arbitrary. Right? So if I want to do the optimal thing, mm -hmm. I'll just say I have two nodes with different resources and communication capabilities, and I'll globally optimize everything. And maybe this is not possible. Maybe you, you have the optimal solution by doing a two-tier thing. But it's not clear to me that that's what you should be doing. Wait, wait. Didn't understand at all. So so, so, so you said the nodes, the most are going to just communicate data up to the... Local processing. This Local micro processing of the data before they communicate Local it. Local processing. Yeah. To this, to this microservice. And the microservice is going to do whatever yeah. communication on top of it. But for example, you could be smart about which modes communicate and how you do the communication paths within the modes. Which you should be. Which you should be, right? But you could also have communication paths that don't go modes to, to microservices. You could. I'm just speaking from a practical, just right. what we've discovered complexity-wise, we haven't gotten to the point that that's worth doing. And I don't mean to say that, I didn't mean to say that what we're doing is optimal. What I meant to say is that we have a heterogeneous mix and we try to optimize who does what in it. Thank you.